welcome to Dreamful Podcast, bedtime stories for slumber. I would like to start off this episode by thanking my newest Patreon supporter, Sharon Jasmine. Thank you so much for your support. I truly appreciate it. If you would like to help support the podcast, please visit patreon.com slash dreamfulpodcast, where you can make monthly or one-time donations to the production of our show. Another way you can support our podcast is to take a quick moment to leave a rating and review. This really helps other listeners to find us. The music in this episode is by The Sky Colony. They are a really wonderful Cascadia folk band based out of Washington State. Their most recent album, All of Us, was released a few months ago and I highly recommend giving it a listen. I put links to their music and social media in the show notes so you can easily find them and their beautiful music. Tonight I will be reading you an adaptation of Dr. Doolittle. This is a very long story, so I will only be reading part one. You can find the continuation of this story in a separate bonus episode on my Patreon page. So, snuggle up in your blankets and have sweet dreams. Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a doctor, and his name was John Doolittle. He lived in a little town called Puddleby on the Marsh. All the folks, young and old, knew him well, and whenever he walked down the street in his high hat, the dogs and the children would all run up and follow behind him. The house he lived in on the edge of the town was quite small, but his garden was very large. He was very fond of animals and kept many kinds of pets. Besides the goldfish in the pond at the bottom of his garden, he had rabbits in his pantry, white mice in his piano, a squirrel in the linen closet, and a hedgehog in the cellar. He had a cow with a calf too, and an old horse, and chickens and pigeons and two lambs and many other animals. But his favorite pets were Dab Dab the duck, Jip the dog, Gub Gub the baby pig, Polynesia the parrot, and the owl Tutu. As time went on, the doctor got more and more animals, and the people who came to see him got less and less, and he kept on getting still more pets, and of course it cost a lot to feed them, and the money he had saved up grew littler and littler. And now, when he walked down the streets in his high hat, People would say to one another, There goes John Doolittle. There was a time when he was the best known doctor in the West Country. Look at him now. He hasn't any money, and his stockings are full of holes. But the dogs and the cats and the children still ran up and followed him through the town, the same as they had done when he was rich. It happened one day that the doctor was sitting in his kitchen talking with the cat's meat man who had come to see him with a stomach ache. Why don't you give up being a people's doctor and be an animal doctor? asked the cat's meat man. The parrot, Polynesia, was sitting in the window looking out at the rain and singing a sailor song to herself. She stopped singing and started to listen. You see, doctor, the cat's meat man went on, you know all about animals, much more than what these here vets do. That book you wrote, about cats? Why, it's wonderful. And look, all the farmers round about who had lame horses and weak lambs, they'd come. Be an animal doctor. When the cat's meat man had gone, the parrot flew off the window onto the doctor's table and said, That man's got sense. That's what you ought to do. Give the silly people up if they haven't brains enough to see you're the best doctor in the world. 
take care of animals instead. Oh, there are plenty of animal doctors, said John Doolittle. Yes, there are plenty, said Polynesia, but none of them are any good at all. Now listen, doctor, and I'll tell you something. Did you know that animals can talk? I knew that parrots can talk, said the doctor. Oh, we parrots can talk in two languages. People's language and bird language, said Polynesia proudly. Hmm, tell me more, said the doctor, all excited. This is interesting, very interesting, something quite new. So that was the way the doctor came to know that animals had a language of their own and could talk to one another. After a while, with the parrot's help, the doctor got to learn the language of the animals so well that he could talk to them himself and understand everything they said. As soon as everyone knew John Doolittle was going to become an animal doctor, old ladies began to bring them their pet pugs and poodles who had eaten too much cake, and farmers came many miles to show him sick cows and sheep. And whenever any creatures got sick, not only horses and cows and dogs, but all the little things of the fields, like harvest mice, badgers, and bats, they came at once to his house on the edge of the town, so that his big garden was nearly always crowded with animals trying to get in to see him. And so, in a few years' time, every living thing for miles and miles got to know about John Doolittle, and the birds who flew to other countries in the winter told the animals in foreign lands of the wonderful doctor of Puddleby on the Marsh, who could understand their talk and help them in their troubles. In this way, he became famous among the animals. Once when he was sitting on his garden wall, smoking a pipe in the evening, an Italian organ grinder came round with a monkey on a string. The doctor saw at once that the monkey's collar was too tight, and that he was dirty and unhappy. So he took the monkey away from the Italian, gave the man a shilling, and told him to go. The organ grinder got awfully angry and said that he wanted to keep the monkey, but the doctor told him that if he didn't go away, he would punch him on the nose. John Doolittle was a strong man, though he wasn't very tall. So the Italian went away saying rude things, and the monkey stayed with Dr. Doolittle and had a good home. The other animals in the house called him Chi-Chi, which is a common word in monkey language, meaning ginger. And another time, when the circus came to Puddleby, the crocodile who had a bad toothache escaped at night and came into the doctor's garden. The doctor talked to him in crocodile language, and took him into the house and made his tooth better. But when the crocodile saw what a nice house it was, with all the different places for the different kinds of animals, he too wanted to live with the doctor. He asked, couldn't he sleep in the fish pond at the bottom of the garden, if he promised not to eat the fish? When the circus men came to take him back, he got so wild and savage that he frightened them away. But to everyone in the house, he was always as gentle as a kitten. But now, the old ladies grew afraid to send their lap dogs to Dr. Doolittle because of the crocodile, and the farmers wouldn't believe that he would not eat the lambs and sick calves they brought to be cured. So the doctor went to the crocodile and told him he must go back to his circus. But he wept such big tears, and begged so hard to be allowed to stay that the doctor had the heart to turn him out, and very soon he was poorer than he had ever been before. With all these mouths to fill, and the house to look after, and no money coming in to pay the butcher's bill, things began to look very difficult, but the doctor didn't worry at all. The snow came earlier that year than normal, and that winter was a very cold one. And one night in December, when they were all sitting around the warm fire in the kitchen, and the doctor was reading aloud to them out of books he had written himself in animal language, the owl Tutu suddenly said, Shh, what's that noise outside? They all listened, 
and presently they heard the sound of someone running. Then the door flew open and the monkey Chi-Chi ran in, badly out of breath. Doctor, he cried, I've just had a message from a cousin of mine in Africa. There is a terrible sickness among the monkeys out there. They are all catching it, and they are dying in hundreds. They have heard of you and beg you to come to Africa to stop the sickness. Who brought the message? asked the doctor, taking off his spectacles and laying down his book. A swallow, said Chi Chi. She is outside in the rain. Bring her in by the fire, said the doctor. She must be perished with the cold. The swallows flew south six weeks ago. So the swallow was brought in, all huddled and shivering, and although she was a little afraid at first, she soon got warmed up and sat on the edge of the mantelpiece and began to talk. When she had finished, the doctor said, I would gladly go to Africa, especially in this bitter weather, but I'm afraid we haven't money enough to buy the tickets. Perhaps if I go down to the seaside, I shall be able to borrow a boat that will take us to Africa. I knew a sailor once who brought his baby to me with measles. Maybe he'll lend us his boat. The baby got well. So early the next morning, the doctor went down to the seashore, and when he came back, he told the animals it was all right. The sailor was going to lend them the boat. Then the crocodile and the monkey and the parrot were very glad and began to sing, because they were going back to Africa, their real home. And the doctor said, I shall only be able to take you three. With Jip the dog, Dab Dab the duck, Gub Gub the pig, and the owl Tutu. Then the animals packed up. They carried all their luggage down to the seashore and got onto the boat. The swallow said she had been to that country many times and would show them how to get there. So the doctor told Chi Chi to pull up the anchor, and the voyage began. Now for six whole weeks they went sailing on and on, over the rolling sea, following the swallow who flew before the ship to show them the way. At night she carried a tiny lantern, so they would not miss her in the dark. And the people on the other ships that passed said that the light must be a shooting star. As they sailed further and further into the south, it got warmer and warmer. Polynesia, Chi Chi, and the crocodile enjoyed the hot sun. They ran about laughing and looking over the ship to see if they could see Africa yet. When they got near to the equator, they saw some flying fishes coming towards them, and the fishes asked the parrot if this was Dr. Doolittle's ship. When she told them it was, they said they were glad, because the monkeys in Africa were getting worried that he would never come. Polynesia asked them how many miles they had yet to go, and the flying fishes said it was only 55 miles now to the coast of Africa. The next evening, as the sun was going down, the doctor said, Get me the telescope, Chi Chi. Our journey is nearly ended. Very soon we should be able to see the shores of Africa. And about half an hour later, sure enough, they thought they could see something in front that might be land. But it began to get darker and darker, and they couldn't be sure. Then a great storm came up with thunder and lightning. The wind howled, the rain came down in torrents, and the waves got so high they splashed right over the boat. Presently, there was a big bang. The ship stopped and rolled over on its side. What's happened? asked the doctor, coming up from downstairs. I'm not sure, said the parrot. But I think we're shipwrecked. Tell the duck to get out and see. So Dab Dab dived right down under the waves. And when she came up, she said they had struck a rock. There was a big hole in the bottom of the ship. The water was coming in, and they were sinking fast. We must have run into Africa, said the doctor. Dear me, dear me. Well, we must all swim to land. But Chi Chi and Gub Gub did not know how to swim. Get the rope, said Polynesia. I told you it would come in handy. Where's that duck? 
Come here, Dab Dab. Take this end of the rope, fly to the shore and tie it onto a palm tree. And we'll hold the other end on the ship here. Then those that can't swim must climb along the rope till they reach the land. So they all got safely to the shore, some swimming, some flying, and those that climbed along the rope brought the doctor's trunk and handbag with them. Then they all took shelter in a nice dry cave they found high up in the cliffs till the storm was over. When the sun came out next morning, they went down to the sandy beach to dry themselves. Then the monkey Chi Chi suddenly said, Shh, I hear footsteps in the jungle. They all stopped talking and listened. And soon an African man came down out of the woods and asked them what they were doing there. My name is John Doolittle, MD, said the doctor. I have been asked to come to Africa to cure the monkeys who are sick. You must all come before the king, said the man. What king? asked the doctor, who didn't want to waste any time. The king of Jolly Ginky, the man answered. All these lands belong to him, and all strangers must be brought before him. Follow me. So they gathered up their baggage and went off, following the man through the jungle. When they had gone a little way through the thick forest, they came to a wide, clear space, and they saw the king's palace, which was made of mud. This was where the king lived with his queen, Ermintrude, and their son, Prince Bumpo. The prince was away fishing for salmon in the river, but the king and queen were sitting under an umbrella before the palace door. When the doctor had come up to the palace, the king asked him his business, and the doctor told him why he had come to Africa. You may not travel through my lands, said the king. Many years ago, a foreigner came to these shores, and I was very kind to him. But after he had dug holes in the ground to get the gold, and killed all the elephants to get their ivory tusks, he went away secretly in his ship, without so much as saying thank you. Never again shall a foreign man travel through the lands of Jolly Ginky. Then the king turned to some of the soldiers who were standing near and said, Take away this medicine man with all his animals and lock them up in my strongest prison. So six of the men led the doctor and all his pets away and shut them up in a stone dungeon. The dungeon had only one little window high up in the wall with bars in it and the door was strong and thick. Then they all grew very sad and Gub Gub the pig began to cry. Are we all here? asked the doctor after he got used to the dim light. Yes, I think so, said the duck, and started to count them. Where's Polynesia? asked the crocodile. She isn't here. Are you sure? said the doctor. I suppose she escaped, grumbled the crocodile. Well, that's just like her. Sneaked off into the jungle as soon as her friends got into trouble. I'm not that kind of bird, said the parrot, climbing out of the pocket in the tail of the doctor's coat. You see, I'm small enough to get through the bars of that window and I was afraid they would put me in a cage instead. So while the king was busy talking, I hid in the doctor's pocket, and here I am. That's what you call a ruse, she said, smoothing down her feathers with her beak. Now listen, said Polynesia. Tonight, as soon as it gets dark, I'm going to creep through the bars of that window and fly over to the palace. And then, you'll see, I'll soon find a way to make the king let us all out of prison. So that night, when the moon was shining through the palm trees, and all the king's men were asleep, the parrot slipped out through the bars of the prison and flew across to the palace. The pantry window had been broken by a tennis ball the week before, and Polynesia popped in through the hole in the glass. She heard Prince Bumpo snoring in his bedroom at the back of the palace. Then she tiptoed up the stairs till she came to the king's bedroom. She opened the door gently and peeped in. The queen was away at a dance that night at her cousin's, but the king was in bed fast asleep. Polynesia crept in very softly and hid under the bed. 
Then she coughed, just the way Dr. Doolittle used to cough. Polynesia can mimic anyone. Then the parrot coughed again, loud like a man, and the king sat up wide awake and he said, Who's that? I'm Dr. Doolittle, said the parrot, just the way the doctor would have said it. What are you doing in my bedroom, cried the king. How dare you get out of prison? Where are you? I don't see you. But the parrot just laughed. A long, deep, jolly laugh, just like the doctor's. Stop laughing and come here at once so I can see you, said the king. Foolish king, answered Polynesia. Have you forgotten that you are talking to John Doolittle, M.D., the most wonderful man on earth? Of course you cannot see me. I have made myself invisible. There is nothing I cannot do. Now listen, I have come here tonight to warn you. If you don't let me and my animals travel through your kingdom, I will make you and all your people sick like the monkeys. For I can make people well, and I can make people ill, just by raising my little finger. Send your soldiers at once to open the dungeon door, or you shall have mumps before the morning sun has risen on the hills of Jolly Ginky. Then the king began to tremble and was very much afraid. Doctor, he cried, it shall be as you say. Do not raise your little finger, please. And he jumped out of bed and ran to tell the soldiers to open the prison door. As soon as he was gone, Polynesia crept downstairs and left the palace by the pantry window. But the queen, who was just letting herself in at the back door, saw the parrot getting out through the broken glass. And when the king came back to bed, she told him what she had seen. Then the king understood that he had been tricked, and he was dreadfully angry. He hurried back to the prison at once. But he was too late. The door stood open. The dungeon was empty. The doctor and all his animals were gone. All this time the doctor and his animals were running through the forest toward the land of the monkeys, as fast as they could go. The king of the Jolly Ginky thought it would be easy for his army to find them, because the doctor was in a strange land and would not know his way. But he was wrong, because the monkey Chi Chi knew all the paths through the jungle, better than even the king's men did. Chi Chi climbed up a high rock and looked out over the treetops, and when he came down, he said they were now quite close to the land of the monkeys and would soon be there. And that same evening, sure enough, they saw Chi-Chi's cousin and a lot of other monkeys, who had not yet got sick, sitting in the trees by the edge of a swamp, looking and waiting for them. And when they saw the famous doctor really come, these monkeys made a tremendous noise, cheering and waving leaves and swinging out the branches to greet him. They wanted to carry his bag and his trunk and everything he had, and one of the bigger ones even carried Gub-Gub, who had gotten tired again. Then two of them rushed on in front to tell the sick monkeys that the great doctor had come at last. But the king's men, who were still following, had heard the noise of the monkeys cheering, and they at last knew where the doctor was, and hastened on to catch him. One of the monkeys saw the captain of the army sneaking through the trees, so he hurried after the doctor and told him to run. Then they all ran harder than they had ever run in their lives, and the king's men, coming after them, began to run too. But before they could get into the land of the monkeys, they came to a steep cliff with a river flowing below. This was the end of the kingdom of Jolly Ginky, and the land of the monkeys was on the other side, across the river. And Jip the dog looked down over the edge of the steep, steep cliff and said, Golly, how are we ever going to get across? Oh dear, said Gub Gub, the king's men are quite close now. Look at them. I'm afraid we are going to be taken back to prison again. And he began to weep. But the big monkey who was carrying the pig dropped him on the ground and cried out to the other monkeys. Boys, a bridge. Quick, make a bridge. The doctor began to wonder what they were going to make a bridge out of. And he gazed around to see if they had any boards hidden any place. But when he looked back at the cliff, there, hanging across the river, was a bridge all ready for him, made of living monkeys. For while his back was turned, the monkeys, quick as a flash, had made themselves into a bridge, just by holding hands and feet. And the big one shouted to the doctor, 
Walk over, walk over, all of you, hurry. Gub Gub was a bit scared walking on such a narrow bridge at that dizzy height above the river, but he got over all right, and so did all of them. John Doolittle was the last to cross, and just as he was getting to the other side, the king's men came rushing up to the edge of the cliff. Then they shook their fists and yelled with rage, for they saw that they were too late. The doctor and all his animals were safe in the land of the monkeys, and the bridge was pulled across to the other side. John Doolittle now became dreadfully busy. He found hundreds and thousands of monkeys sick. The first thing he did was to separate the sick ones from the well ones. Then he got Chi Chi and his cousin to build him a little house of grass. The next thing, he made all the monkeys who were still well come and be vaccinated. And for three days and three nights, the monkeys kept coming from the jungles and the valleys and the hills to the little house of grass where the doctor sat all day and night. Very soon the monkeys began to get better. At the end of a week, the big house full of beds were half empty. And at the end of the second week, the last monkey had gotten well. Then the doctor's work was done and he was so tired he went to bed and slept for three days without even turning over. Chi Chi stood outside the doctor's door keeping everybody away till he woke up. Then John Doolittle told the monkeys that he must now go back to Puddleby. When the packing was finished and everything was ready to start, the monkeys gave a grand party for the doctor, and all the animals of the jungle came. And they had pineapples and mangoes and honey and all sorts of good things to eat and drink. After they had all finished eating, the doctor got up and said, My friends, I am not clever at speaking long words after dinner but I wish to tell you that I am very sad at leaving your beautiful country. After I've gone, remember never to let the flies settle on your food before you eat it, and do not sleep on the ground when the rains are coming. I hope you all will live happily ever after. When the doctor stopped speaking and sat down, all the monkeys clapped their hands a long time and said to one another, let it be remembered always among our people that he sat and ate with us here under the trees, for surely he is the greatest of men. Then, when the party was over, the doctor and his pets started out to go back to the seashore, and all the monkeys went with him as far as the edge of their country, carrying his trunk and bags to see him off. By the edge of the river they stopped and said farewell, this took a long time because all those thousands of monkeys wanted to shake John Doolittle by the hand. When they had said their goodbyes, Dr. Doolittle and his animals began their journey back. One day, while they were passing through a very thick part of the forest, Chi Chi went ahead of them to look for coconuts. And while he was away, the doctor and the rest of the animals, who did not know the jungle path so well, got lost deep in the woods. They wandered around and around, but could not find their way down to the seashore. Chi Chi, when he could not see them anywhere, was terribly upset. He climbed high trees and looked out from the top branches to try and see the doctor's hi-hat. He waved and shouted. He called to all the animals by name, but it was no use. They seemed to have disappeared altogether. Indeed, they had lost their way very badly. They had strayed a long way off the path, and the jungle was so thick with bushes and creepers and vines that sometimes they could hardly move at all and the doctor had to take out his pocket knife and cut his way along. They stumbled into wet, boggy places. They scratched themselves on thorns, and twice they nearly lost the medicine bag in the underbrush. There seemed no end to their troubles, and nowhere could they come upon a path. At last, 
After blundering about like this for many days, getting their clothes torn and their faces covered with mud, they walked right into the king's back garden by the stake. The king's men came running up at once and caught them, but Polynesia flew into a tree in the garden without anybody seeing her and hid herself. The doctor and the rest were taken before the king. Ha ha, cried the king, so you are caught again. This time you shall not escape. Take them all back to prison and put double locks on the door. This is a great nuisance, said the doctor. I really must get back to Puddleby. That poor sailor will think I've stolen his ship if I don't get home soon. I wonder if these hinges are loose. But the door was very strong and firmly locked. There seemed no chance of getting out. Then Gub Gub began to cry again. All this time Polynesia was still sitting in the tree in the palace garden. Presently she spied Chi Chi swinging through the tree, still looking for the doctor. When Chi Chi saw her, he came into a tree and asked her what had become of them. The doctor and all the animals had been caught by the king's men and locked up again, whispered Polynesia. We lost our way in the jungle and blundered into the palace garden by mistake. But you couldn't guide them, asked Chi Chi, and he began to scold the parrot for letting them get lost while he was away looking for the coconuts. It was all that stupid pig's fault, said Polynesia. He would keep running off the path hunting for ginger roots, and I was kept so busy catching him and bringing him back that I turned to the left instead of the right when we reached the swamp. Shh, look, there's Prince Bumpo coming into the garden. And there, sure enough, was Prince Bumpo, the king's son, opening the garden gate. He carried a book of fairy tales under his arm, he came strolling down the gravel walk, humming a sad song, till he reached a stone seat right under the tree where the parrot and the monkey were hiding. Then he lay down on the seat and began reading the fairy stories to himself. Chi-Chi and Polynesia watched him, keeping very quiet and still. After a while, the king's son laid the book down and sighed a weary sigh. If I were only a handsome prince, the prince said, with a dreamy, faraway look in his eyes. Then the parrot, talking in a small high voice like a little girl, said aloud, Bumpo, someone might turn thee into a handsome prince perchance. The king's son started up off the seat and looked all around. What is this I hear, he cried. I thought the sweet music of a fairy silver voice rang from over there. Strange. Worthy prince, said Polynesia, keeping very still so Bumpo couldn't see her. Thou sayest winged words of truth, for tis I, Tripsatinka, the queen of the fairies that speak to thee. I am hiding in a rosebud. Oh, tell me, fairy queen, cried Bumpo, clasping his hands in joy. Who is it that can turn me handsome? In thy father's prison, said the parrot, there lies a famous wizard, John Doolittle by name. Many things he knows of medicine and magic and mighty deeds he has performed. Yet thy kingly father leaves him languishing long and lingering hours. Go to him, brave Bumbo, secretly when the sun has set, and behold, thou shalt be made the handsomest prince that ever won, fair lady. I have said enough. I must now go back to fairyland. Farewell. Farewell, cried the prince. A thousand thanks, good Tripsatinka. And he sat down on the seat again with a smile upon his face, waiting for the sun to set. Very, very quietly, making sure that no one should see her, Polynesia then slipped out at the back of the tree and flew across to the prison. She found Gub Gub poking his nose through the bars of the window, trying to sniff the cooking smells that came from the palace kitchen. She told the pig to bring the doctor to the window because she wanted to speak to him. So Gub Gub went and woke the doctor who was taking a nap. Listen, whispered the parrot when John Doolittle's face appeared. Prince Bumpo is coming out here tonight to see you. And you've got to find some way to turn him handsome. Be sure to make him promise you first that he will open the prison door and find a ship for you to cross the sea in. 
This is all very well, said the doctor, but it isn't so easy to turn someone handsome. I don't know anything about that, said Polynesia impatiently, but you must think of a way. Think hard. You've got plenty of things in the medicine bag. It is your only chance to get out of prison. That night, Prince Bumbo came secretly to the doctor in prison and said to him, Wizard, I am an unhappy prince. Years ago, I went in search of the Sleeping Beauty, whom I had read of in a book, and having traveled through the world many days, I at last found her and kissed the lady very gently to awaken her, as the book said I should. Tis true indeed that she awoke, but when she saw my face, she cried out, Oh, he's ugly, and she ran away and wouldn't marry me, but went to sleep again somewhere else. So I came back, full of sadness to my father's kingdom. Now I hear that you are a wonderful magician and have many powerful potions. So I come to you for help. If you will turn me handsome so that I may go back to the Sleeping Beauty, I will give you half my kingdom and anything besides you ask. Prince Bumpo, said the doctor, looking thoughtfully at the bottles in his medicine bag. Supposing I dyed your hair a nice color, would that do to make you happy? You know, it's very hard to change hair color. One of the hardest things a magician can do. You would look very handsome with red or blonde or perhaps blue. This idea pleased the prince, and he went away to get a ship ready at the seashore, just as the doctor had requested. When he came back and said that it was done, the doctor asked Dab Dab to bring a basin. Then he mixed a lot of medicines in the basin and told Bumpo to dip his head in it. The prince leaned down and put his head in. He held it there a long time, so long that the doctor seemed to get dreadfully anxious and fidgety, standing first on one leg and then on the other, looking at all the bottles he had used for the mixture and reading the labels on them again and again. A strong smell filled the prison, like the smell of paper burning. At last the prince lifted his head out the basin, and all the animals cried out in surprise, for the prince's hair had turned white as snow. When John Doolittle lent him a little looking glass to see himself in, he sang for joy and began dancing around the prison. Bumpo, said the doctor to the prince, your happiness has completed the spell, for the happiness within you shines from your eyes and that has made you the most handsome of all. Prince Bumpo begged that he might keep the looking glass, as it was the only one in the kingdom of Jolly Ginky, and he wanted to look at himself all day long. But the doctor said he needed to shave with it. Then the prince, taking a bunch of copper keys from his pocket, undid the great double locks, and the doctor with all his animals ran as fast as they could down to the seashore while Bumpo leaned against the wall of the empty dungeon, smiling after them happily. When they came to the beach, they saw Polynesia and Chi-Chi waiting for them on the rocks near the ship. Gub-Gub the pig, Dab-Dab the duck, Chip the dog, and the owl Tutu went on the ship with the doctor. But Chi-Chi, Polynesia, and the crocodile stayed behind, because Africa was their proper home, the land where they were born. And when the doctor stood upon the boat, he looked over the side across the water. And then he remembered that they had no one with them to guide them back to Bottleby. The wide, wide sea looked terribly big and lonesome in the moonlight, and he began to wonder if they would lose their way when they passed out of sight of land. But even while he was wondering, they heard a strange whispering noise high in the air, coming through the night, and the animals all stopped saying goodbye and listened. The noise grew louder and bigger. It seemed to be coming nearer to them, a sound like the autumn wind blowing through the leaves of a poplar tree, or a great, great rain beating down upon a roof. And Jip, with his nose pointing and his tail quite straight, said, Birds! Millions of them! Flying fast, that's it! And then they all looked up, and there, streaming across the face of the moon, 
Like a huge swarm of tiny ants, they could see thousands and thousands of little birds. Soon the whole sky seemed full of them, and still more kept coming, more and more. There were so many that for a little while they covered the whole moon so it could not shine, and the sea grew dark and black. And presently all these birds came down close, skimming over the water and the land, and the night sky was left clear above, and the moon shone as before. Still never a call nor a cry nor a song they made, no sound but this great rustling of feathers, which grew greater now than ever. When they began to settle in the sands, along the ropes of the ship, anywhere and everywhere, the doctor could see that they had blue wings and white breasts and very short feathered legs. As soon as they had all found a place to sit, suddenly there was no noise left anywhere. All was quiet, all was still. And in the silent moonlight, John Doolittle spoke. I had no idea that we had been in Africa so long. It will be nearly summer when we get home, for these are the swallows going back. Swallows, I thank you for waiting for us. It is very thoughtful of you. Now we need not be afraid that we will lose our way upon the sea. Pull up the anchor and set sail. When the ship moved out upon the water, those who stayed behind, Chi-Chi, Polynesia, and the Crocodile, grew terribly sad. For never in their lives had they known anyone they liked so well as Dr. John Doolittle of Puddleby on the Marsh. And after they had called goodbye to him, again and again and again, they still stood there upon the rocks, crying bitterly and waving till the ship was out of sight. <laughs>